Thank you, Banjana. Um, I'm very happy to be back. Um, what um, what I'll do is I, I, I mean I spoke a little bit earlier on with with uh, some of the people that that had shown up uh, early. Um, you know, both um, Rash and I have been really interested in examining um, how the past has always played a role in informing the present. And, and you know, we live in, in such a transformative place in Dubai that we're always questioning the origin of things. Um, why are things the way they are? Uh, and although we've published some of this and we've exhibited some of this, uh, sometimes it's important to take a step back and, and to go to the fundamentals. Um, most recently, we've been uh, very interested in the urban core of Dubai, which is Deira, and how some of the things uh, had started in that, uh, in that nucleus. Um, but one of the questions that emerged from thinking about this is, why is Dubai so obsessed with man-made islands? Where did this obsession begin? How did it start? Um, and so um, what, what I'll do is rather than narrate a story, present and pose a series of questions and through these series of questions, attempt to uh, find the answers. So the first question is, is why is Dubai so obsessed with man-made islands? And through this examination, we went to the core, which is when was the first man-made island proposed in Dubai? The second is, what was being proposed? And the third question is, who were the people and the architects that had proposed this idea? And to set this context, I think it's quite important to show a small clip that demonstrate what Dubai was like in the 1970s. One of them is called Dubai. Like her neighbors, Dubai is all desert. Summer temperatures, 120 degrees. A few inches. Vegetation, negligible. A country depending on desert could barely subsist, let alone prosper. The key to Dubai's survival and to her wealth was water. with a population of only 70,000 people has become a major international trading center. ABC was the London Stock Market Report changed to the bar. There was little change in London stock markets from the unsettled conditions ruling last week, and although there was a certain amount of selective buying of equities, going on falls were in the majority. How did Dubai achieve this prosperity? This man is one answer. His Highness Sheikh Rashid bin Zayed Al Maktoum, ruler of Dubai. His rule is direct and personal. But he's also a businessman, and as such appreciates that business thrives where there's stable government, simple legislation, and freedom from red tape. So this is the way he rules. The other answer is this creek, six miles long and deep enough for coastal shipping. The desert offered Dubai nothing, so she turned to the sea. First for fish, then pearls, then trade. Sheikh Rashid borrowed money to have this natural harbor dredged, then sold the reclaimed land to repay the loan. The door was now open to commerce on a major scale. So the, uh, now that I've posed these series of questions and, and we've put this, we've presented this video, I think it's important to contextualize 
what made Dubai the way it is for uh, as, a, as a trading settlement. And it's this creek, this natural phenomenon that made, that allowed ships to, to dock during uh, seasons that were, um, you know, inhospitable for ships that were moving from, from west to east. And this natural creek phenomenon attracted the ships, brought settlement in, people from rural areas uh, came to the city. This is where the creek is uh, in contrast. The city has grown uh, 180 times since, it's, uh, since the middle of last, the last century. The population grew from 60,000 to over 2.5 million today. So immense and rapid growth in such a short period of time. But before we jump into the narrative of what, what man-made islands, I think it's important to just uh, go back and understand when the origins of man-made islands uh, started. And although there might be other examples, uh, but the institutionalization of, of, of the creation of man-made islands by the state uh, began in the 14th century in Holland. And the reason that existed is because it was mainly for survival. Uh, Holland is 30% uh, underwater, they needed uh, government-based institutions that were funded by the kingdom to uh, to uh, create polders, to create water breakers, even from an ingenuity perspective, bring in windmills to extract water to make land available. Of course, historically, Venice uh, as well had created water breakers to protect its city. Uh, from flooding. And this continued all the way through to modern proposals uh, with, with Corbusier proposing the, um, the hospital in Venice, not only as an intervention within the city, but an extension of an island that, uh, that goes uh, beyond the city. And the third example is the housing crisis which took place in Tokyo. Uh, migration from rural to urban areas began to grow. Housing was in extreme shortage in Tokyo. And, and what had made Kenzo Tange was this proposal uh, for Tokyo Bay, of which others had come in. And I think now that we've, we've set the idea of, of what man-made islands uh, were, I think it's also important to understand what was proposed uh, in Dubai specifically, and what were the reasons for the proposal? The first is that the creek, um, from an ecological perspective, uh, was losing its value. Uh, erosion uh, started to kick in, uh, to take place. The uh, ships could not berth uh, in the creek, and there are all these folklore stories of people pushing the ships out, uh, in order for, uh, for them to leave. So the city started losing its functionality. And so an engineer uh, called William Halcrow was asked to come in, and he had proposed in 1956 to begin dredging the creek. Uh, and based on his proposal, the introduction of creek dredging took place. Um, as you can see on the top right, and the, 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 the creek began to erode as a consequence of tides and water rising, or ocean level rising. On the left-hand side is with the intervention allowing ships to come in, and this continued to take place over the next decade or so. I think we had a little bit too much fun afterwards. So, <laughs> so I think um, this continues till modern day, but I mean, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, I think it's important to focus specifically on who and what was proposed for the, um, for the first man-made island in Dubai. Uh, to contextualize, the 1970s was quite an important time. Uh, we had just you know, landed in the moon in 1969. The Osaka Expo had just taken place. Engineering was at, uh, was at, at, at the cusp. People were really thinking in, in interesting ways. But at the same time, critical regionalism was a narrative that kicked in. Kenneth Frampton, um, architecture for the poor, Hassan Fethi uh, had, had just redesigned the Gurna. Um, Paolo Portuguese also had redesigned had designed the Mosque of Rome. So the, the idea of critical regionalism, Islam, but at the same time, this narrative of building and constructing um, the unimaginable was, was at people's uh, grasp. And part of Team 10 were uh, Riley and Rima Patela. 
um, who were Finnish architects that were less known than Saarinen, but were quite active globally. They had built a palace uh, in Kuwait. They had built the Finnish embassy uh, in India. And they had received the brief to redesign uh, the creek, which, is, which was part of the DRC Corniche proposal. And, and the, the actual proposal itself uh, was quite interesting because it, it was in some aspects conservative uh, and wanted to retain the urban identity of the city. It wanted to design compact buildings, uh, make sure that the sikkas that were originally based in the old part of the city were retained. So based on this brief and their thinking, they had proposed this interesting multi-layered design approach. Based on their thinking um, earlier on, they were part of two or three meetings in Siam where they were thinking about Venice and how Venice retained its identity without uh, losing, without modernizing without losing its character. And they had reintroduced in a multi-leveled way the wind towers, which are evident on the top uh, of, of the buildings, but going up three or four stories. Uh, they had intervened between the buildings with landscape architecture. Um, but, not, but their designs were not only based on the aesthetic. They were really thinking about um, the population growth that would take place as a consequence of the development of the city. And, and so rather than looking at urban sprawl horizontally against the coast, which, is, uh, which was naturally what was going to take place, there were, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that this was an, a good approach, but it was a different approach where they were thinking about townships and probably looking at Judeca or the Lido in Venice and trying to emulate some of those cities uh, or some of those areas. Similarly, here you can see that uh, a kind of Grand Canal replica was taking place uh, in Deira. Um, at the edge of the city. So it's a, it's a different proposal with these bridges in the back than what, what is available in the city. And their thinking was also um, revolved around the idea of, of, uh, of growth. This, uh, you know, this map on the left uh, mimics uh, um, Burgess's concentric circle plans. It looks at retaining the urban core of the city, but also advocating for as much urban open spaces as possible, and with a township on the bottom left. This was their final master plan. Um, on on the on the top uh, on the top right hand side, they had proposed to do a sports facility. They had proposed to do a university called Dubai University. Uh, there's a tower there where they wanted to call it Burj Rashid, which was kind of a San Marco esque uh, structure. But on the bottom left, you can see that there's a a new township that connects by the water. Through a uh, through a kind of a, a ferry uh, connection, so they really wanted to retain the identity in a different way, um, and this is uh, the model that's available at the Finnish Architectural Museum. Um, some of the points connecting to the old, redefining the urban core, and the proposal for a township. And so, how is this proposal related to what exists in the city today? Um, and this is their master plan overlaid with the current master plan of the city at the moment, or the current map of the city. And whether it was the town planners at the time who had retained their original master plan or not, the new extensions within the city uh, are overlaid with the original master plans that Raila Nima Petela had proposed in 1974. So there is a continuity of that original plan uh, in place. Um, a small point is BBPR won the bid uh, for the competition, and the master plan was never built. But um, their proposal, nevertheless, is, is constantly um, repeated in, uh, when discussing original proposals in Dubai. Um, this is part of uh, an article which we've recently written for C20, and it's out uh, and talks about Dubai's first man-made island. Thank you. So, Mandina, what do you think? Okay. 
Should I say the fact about dinosaurs or it's not? Yeah, okay. The reason why, <laughs> the reason why Dubai and, and the Gulf states have a lot of oil is because and this is a fact which we've recently discovered uh, or recently published is that there was a lot of dinosaurs in the Gulf. And so as a result, that created a lot of fossil fuel and Manjina liked that fact. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's quite fascinating, the connection between dinosaurs and fossil fuel, but I, I think it's a whole... Um, um, I guess uh, maybe to, I think it would be great to have a bit of a dis discussion about some of the questions you provoked yeah. um, in the in in the presentation. But I was also interested in something you said in the sneak preview some of us got before the lecture started, where you talked about growing up in Dubai, uh, you would call the construction generation, like as a place that's changed so dramatically over time. And I was just curious as to how that that has shaped this research project. Like, how, when did this project start of gathering all these different sources, finding out? about this competition, um, the influence of the petals on, on, on the shaping of like what Dubai would eventually become. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up in, the, in, in Dubai in the 80s uh, and the 90s was quite interesting, simply because I think the, you know, the population was so diverse, you know, the Hindu temple was built in 1918. Um, you know, we have a large Palestinian, Jordanian, Lebanese community. We have a great uh, influence from India. A lot of the words like Darwaza, which is door, uh, is, is, is part of our, of our identity. And I think that mix created an interesting subculture in the city, uh, particularly with the, with, with, with the younger generation who had grown up together. And we identified uh, in public spaces. Um, Patrick Gwynn, for example, is an architect who built the um, the the cafe that sits on the Serpentine in Hyde Park had built a similar structure in Safa Park, which is the largest public park in the city. A lot of the kids grew up spending time around there, and these in these public spaces um, are what defined our youth. And unfortunately, because of the growth of the city, I think sometimes we tend to uh, neglect a lot of uh, you know these 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 spaces that formulated our collective memory and that give us a sense of meaning in the city. And so we're now really, we're looking back at the beginning of where Dubai started, which is Deira, and, and where the gold souk began, where the traders began, and, and where, the, where, where the urban core of the city uh, flourished. And, and we're looking at documenting some of that and narrating that story, particularly as the expo comes in to form this year. What are visitors going to come and experience and understand um, and digest when they're at the city? And so our role is to construct and re-represent an important narrative that defined this identity of the city. Um, I mean, because another, uh, I guess, term you said earlier was about this idea of uh, urban dementia, urban amnesia, like this forgetting of a past. And um, I don't know how much you uh, can share already about what you're, how you're going to narrate this story, but how do you think that will operate, like for people coming to Dubai, maybe for the first time, to uncover this, this kind of hidden history? Uh. I mean, we haven't really thought about it in detail. One of the ways we were thinking of doing it is documenting it in this type of form and talking about it, which is important. Um, a second way, which is uh, which we've experienced in a number of ways, in a number of places, is tours. I think when you when you when you come to Dubai and you go on a specific tour, I think what you see is misrepresentative. Of, of the history of the city, particularly from an architectural and urban perspective. Um, you know, the, what, what had taken place post-mid-century post was really rooted in, in, in architects and narratives that were taking place globally. For example, a Middle Eastern Arab modernist movement um, um, realized a lot of their projects in Dubai, um, whether they're, you know, in the form of the petroleum building in Jumeirah or a water tower. A lot of these ideas were realized in Dubai. And unfortunately, they're not, these stories are not told um, by the right people sometimes or docu are not documented in the right way. Um, and I think only by speaking to somebody and meeting somebody will you be able to understand these stories. So one of the ways is is, is, ta is giving these, you know, tours and speaking to different people. 
Maybe it's, um, my last question before I open it up to the audience. Um, I was curious, I mean, a lot of the imagery that you showed in the talk were really like fantastic maps and sketches and drawings from a, a whole variety of different archives. I mean, this picture is by Gerskin as a kind of like fictional kind of construct slash real, prop I mean, it's, um, I think it's just really interesting about how um, you've gathered the information from a variety of different sources and how that also shapes the telling of the story. Like some of it is from an archive in Finland, some of it is by a kind of artist photographer, like I, some of it is, like I, I'm just curious as to how you use this kind of found material to also tell the story. I think the most important one is the emoji. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, to, 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 first of all, to tell the story is important uh, because it's important to document it for, for future generations. The second way is these archives exist in so many different places and they tell different aspects of the story um, that if you don't put them together, yeah. you'll never be able to, they, they might be lost. Um, well, another one is, is Reba competitions, for example. Reba competitions in the UAE were, were so important that they've documented Cedric Price had proposed to do an island, and a lot of architects had proposed these islands, but these archives never made it uh, to, 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 the, to, to researchers in a way that is told in this narrative. And, I, and what fascinates me about, or, or what is most interesting about this proposal is not what they had proposed, but it was a different approach for what could have been. And I think that, in a way, is, is what is fascinating about it. It's, it's, the, it's the beauty in the unrealized. Um, yeah, it kind of suggests a different trajectory that we might have been on had yeah. this proposal been built. But I'm going to ask the question about the archives because of the, the topic of the series of like how do we shift the canon by maybe stitching together pieces of research that aren't otherwise connected or revealing them to an audience that isn't aware of them. So I think that's really interesting. Anyway, does anyone in the audience want to ask some questions? Thank you for the talk, it was uh, very enjoyable. Um, so my question is basically, um, when tourists come into Dubai, uh, the standard view that they have is the tall and shiny buildings in downtown or Sheikh Zayed Road, um, and the vernacular history of the city uh, tends to be missed out upon. Um, so. Um, how far do you think the Bastakia restoration actually uh, goes towards um, like propagating um, the architectural history of Dubai? Um, I think of the you know the old part of the city, um, the Fahedi, the, Bast the the Fahedi area. It's um, it, it's it's unique in the Gulf. Uh, and the reason why it's so well preserved is it's the only example of a neighborhood that's intact uh, compared with Bahrain or other places where you have two or three houses. Um, and I think from a documentation and vernacular perspective, it's quite important because what it does is it allows you to translate some of those ideas in some form of contemporary manner. Um, the reason why I, we intentionally did not present Palm Island when we we're having a discussion about the islands is because it's easy to reference that, to reference the tallest tower or the largest man-made island. But I think what, uh, what is more important is to go back to when these ideas began and, and to articulate them and document them and to understand how they were part of the very, new, the very in, initial stages of when Dubai was thinking about its identity in terms of its participation in the, in the world. And so the Fahedi was an older version of what you have today in the creek. Um, and so it is important to communicate that vernacular um, to a visiting audience, particularly architects who are from the region. Thank you. Rasha, do you want to contribute somehow? No. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just going to repeat my question from before. 
Um, I, I, and I'd like you to say a bit more about it. I, I always think when I look at the islands, what will happen with sea level rise? Mm. And you said about the uh, creek being eroded. And when they were planned, were we as aware of sea level rise? I mean, just comment on the fact of sea level rise, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let me get technical then. So the IPCC report of 2015 commits us to a, to a two degree or 1.5 degree temperature increase, which means inevitably sea level rises will take place and will affect coastal cities. Dubai is vulnerable to this coastal uh, impact, but at the same time, all coastal cities are taking this seriously. Deep adaptation in terms, in contrast with mitigation, is, is something that Dubai takes seriously. And you can see it. But in what way? Oh, in, I don't know in detail how they are doing. But I do know that there are examples of dredgings and sea barriers uh, being put in place, for example, in the islands. So for in, in the example of the Palm Island, the outer uh, shell is actually a sea breaker. Um, but in technical detail, I do not know. Okay. Um, I actually have another question. But um, uh, I guess when you talked about the kind of alternative trajectory that had they won, the Petulas won the competition, we would have been set on. Could you elaborate a bit more on maybe if you've both speculated on what that might have been? Like what would Dubai have now look like had we had they won the competition um let me just pull that image of what they had uh, yeah, I, I think you know there were so many participants um so the person who master planned for example um the person who master planned the osaka expo of 1970 from 1968 to 1970 uh, built the Dubai municipality, for example. Uh, his name is Dr. Kazuyuki Matsushita. And he had built two or three projects. Um, you know, Rasim Bedran, who was at the time um, kind of was a Richard Rogers-esque um, architect who proposed mechanical buildings on the creek, and they took that proposal very seriously. Um, and Dubai was really interested because it, it was it discovered and modernized in such a latent phase uh, that it wanted to modernize as quickly as possible. So up to 1960, we were living in, in kind of ancient times, and then the minute development took place, there was a rapid thawing and an, uh, an introduction and an integration to the global economy. And as a result of that, that's why Dubai wants to modernize as quickly as possible to catch up with the rest of the world. And so by doing that, it had adopted all these interesting ideas. But, but what makes this proposal, in contrast to what other proposals there were, is that there was an interest in retaining the identity, but yet modernizing. So they weren't stopping the building of the port. They weren't stopping the introduction of an airport. They still retained the modern elements, but they wanted to retain the original identity of the city and grow it somehow. So for example, in the terms of al Fahedi, the wind towers that existed there, they didn't want to get rid of them and develop something completely modern. They wanted to repeat that motif in a kind of new modern way. And that's, if it had taken that uh, direction, we could possibly be looking at a, a totally different city from what it is today. Yeah, I mean, ironically, yesterday I was having a conversation with somebody about the climate crisis who was saying that actually the it's a creative opportunity to look back at history, not to recreate things that happened in the past, but there was a way of approaching how we build and how we design that we maybe need to learn from in order to build kind of contemporary architecture that's very much off now, but that takes lessons from then. And I think this, I mean, your strategy that you talk about today to look back in order to create something maybe more suited for, for now and the future is, is kind of along those same lines, so it's kind of a 
interesting coincidence. Uh, we, we, we're just doing a bit of research for the Biennale for Venice, for the pavilion of the UAE, and we're doing research around salt. And there's this idea that Dubai is a city that emerged from the desert, when in reality it's not true. Dubai emerged from a salt plain. Dubai is, 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 is based on a mangrove natural uh, salt plain. And it, and it basically chose that place because it was a flat land. Uh, and if you look at historical cities like Siwa, uh, which is a city built out of salt on a, on a salt lake, um, 2,000 years uh, after uh, those, those houses were built, they still continue to exist and people still live in them. But they've, 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 mo they've modernized them and, and evolved them. But the original salt block that was created in Siwa, it's called the Kharshif, which is salt and a bit of lime and a bit of sand, is still developed and still in place today. So it's really interesting to, to look at the past not only as a way of, of, of learning, but to see how it sustained itself um, until today. Not definitely. Any other questions? Uh, hello. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, this is really interesting, but I'm also trying to, I mean, I would say maybe a foolish question I have, but I'm trying to understand as well that in some way the image which Dubai is built in today is also, I mean, it, it is kind of a global city in, 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 in many means, but also what you seem to be advocating for is a retention of an identity which also seems to have a lot of global kind of influence. And, and, and there is something which I'm trying to understand, which is, you know, why is it this global identity over the other? I'm, I'm, and for, for one part, but also a second is, I mean, in a city which has marketed itself as a global capital, and, and maybe I think in opposition to Sharqa, which is trying to take the, the cultural aspect, what, you know, why is it that you're advocating actually for a retention of identity in Dubai in particular? I'm, 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 it's not a criticism, but I'm just yeah. trying to understand that in, in, in context. I think it's, it's very important. Yeah, I, I, I understand the question, and I think it's a very important question. Um, and I don't think that I'm not playing a role of an advocate here. There is no form of advocacy. What I'm saying is that this had existed in the past, and this was an iteration of a direction that Dubai could have possibly taken. Whether it is, um, uh, whether it had taken a business route or whether Sharjah or Abu Dhabi have, have their own different approaches to things, I think those are all very interesting. But I think Dubai had, at a specific critical point in time, made choices. These choices were based on economic, political, or social, or, or whatever reasons that they may be. But it's important just to take a step back and immerse ourselves in that moment and to say, isn't this interesting? And how could this have influenced the way we live in the city today? So that's, that's what this is meant to do. And I think that's what this series is meant to examine, not an either or, but a what if and could have been. Hi, um, how do you see I mean, how do you envision Dubai's architectural view in the next 30, 40, 50 years? I mean, over the last few decades, it's through the economy of oil, right? How it's, how it's grown. How do you see it grow from, how do you see it evolve from an economy of oil to an economy of tourism? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, to, to answer that question in a very simple way. But I do know that Dubai is not dependent on oil economically. I think it constitutes somewhere between 5 to 6% of its income. And I think tourism constitutes, um, I don't know what percentage recently, but, but it is, uh, I don't think um, oil formulates a significant portion of its income dependability. Um, from an architectural perspective, I think the city continues to grow simply because the population continues to grow. And, and as the population grows, it, it responds to that. And it's a constant ebb and flow process. I think I did. I said I don't know. Very simply in the beginning, I said I don't. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, so my question is about when you were saying Dubai was modernizing and trying to catch up with the rest of the world. Um, I think like this idea of like modernity is a very, like let's say, um, like a very specific Western idea of what mm -hmm. modernity is. And I don't think it necessarily that that region needs to be catching up or not catching up. Like I think there was something else going on there. Um, for example, I know Dubai and its creation, um, there was this idea of creating an infrastructure for business, like as opposed to oil, as opposed to, for example, let's say Abu Dhabi or Bahrain earlier on or, or Kuwait. So it, there was like a different, uh, like from the, from the start, like a different approach. So like, and it was very much a global city, I think from maybe even to from the 16th century when you had the, you know, the Portuguese, yeah, like, so it's not a very disconnected city, I think, out of, I, I just like a few thoughts that uh, I had um, in mind. Um, um, I think this goes back to the idea of amnesia, like his historical amnesia, what uh, you were talking about. So, um, like, not retaining, like, history, not knowing, kind of, not going, like, the long durée, mm -hmm. like, going really back in history. Um, and I remember there was this talk, I think, uh, where Rashid was talking about the archive, your project in Safa Park mm -hmm. that was removed, and he was saying it's gone, but, you know, it's both relieving and also, um, like, a bit strange that, okay, it's gone, there'll be another archive, or there'll be another, like, another uh, Safa Park, basically. So it's this idea of amnesia, or kind of this removal, or you're not knowing, like, this deeper history, I think, to the city. That's, uh, so it's just, yeah, just maybe a comment, not necessarily a question. Rasha, do you want to? Well, I, I would, the, the only thing that I would add is that it, we tend to see Dubai as, it's, as it evolves in its original motion, whether it's modern and the type of architecture that it pursues from building the tallest tower to building the next tallest tower, and it continues to this rhythm. And it attracts people, and it offers, whether we, whether we come to terms with it or not, it offers people from a region that's in this array a lot of hope. It gives a lot of hope to a, to a geography where, where, where people can realize their potential, whether it's, it's through creative means or artistic or, or economic or entrepreneurial, you see things evolving in that set. But equally, D Dubai is, is another global city in a specific geography, just as Singapore is, and so is Hong Kong. And so are other emerging cities that will come along in Africa as well. So it's, it, what we tend to do, it's, 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 our, it's our role to investigate and explore this past and come to terms with it first and foremost, but also um, learn from it and, and understand what we can uh, continue, in a sense. And, and draw a sense of meaning because I think we are a generation that that are looking for that sense of meaning in, in all of these spaces, like topics of memory, uh, our, um, topics of of, uh, of collective memory are becoming more prominent and 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 more important. And I think this is uh, this is to that point. So, yeah. I mean, maybe as a final question, then it would be interesting to to ask you both to actually maybe comment more on your practice, because I think it's really interesting how, like, the topics you just raised, like, how do you approach projects to make sure that they they de that they're dealing with so many complex issues across a kind of large expanse of time, but are very much rooted in now. But it's a lot about communicating to different audiences, like the value of history, the value of culture, the value of urbanism and architecture. So I'm just curious about what strategy, I mean, I guess be, beyond this project, but across the many projects you've done, um, I think it would be interesting to just hear a bit more about how you operate or how you shape a kind of very different type of practice to a conventional kind of architecture office. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll continue. But so I, I think uh, Ahmed and I have had endless conversations before. Uh, I mean, we published a, ma uh, a magazine for about a decade looking at cities across the Middle East, but we also did a lot of exhibitions around the topic of, of a sense of belonging. 
But more recently, we're looking at the most imminent challenge, which is e our ecological issues and having a, a sense of belonging. Those are the two, I think, imminent crises that we're looking at in the next decades to come. And I think this is, these are conversations, and this is, we did a wonderful project with EPFL and, um, uh, and uh, uh, practice based in India about uh, the water irrigation systems in the uh, southeast part of the, of, the, of the UAE and the fellage systems, which are these, uh, uh, these aqueducts and the waterways and how we looked at closed water systems and how cities can explore themselves, well, sustain themselves off of a certain water reserve and they continue to expand. So that project was, it was so rewarding mm. for us to understand yeah. that cities can be sustainable using rainwater or natural resources and expand and then build two to three story buildings. And more recently now we've been involved with the UAE Pavilion looking at, as Ahmed mentioned, the fact that Dubai was founded on a salt plain and the roles of salt as something within our urban fabric. So I think I think it's, it's more important that as much as it's exciting to look at architecture purely structural or looking at urban planning from a broader perspective, but really looking at the crisis of our times, which are these two topics, creating a sense of belonging and ecology, and how we can put as much energy behind that, I think is the most possible. So he works for me, and he listens to me. So. <laughs> which is why I'm here. He's, he's made me talk on his behalf. He's actually controlling me with remotes, like, at the back. <laughs> typing what I should say. Um, so I guess on that note, where we found out how the dynamics between your relationship work, um, I guess uh, I encourage everyone to, I guess, come approach both of you and ask you questions more informally. And we also have a reception upstairs, so please um, join us in the front of this room. But thank you both very much and for a terrific lecture.